Are we good? Okay. Distance. Huh? I restarted this one now. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, you guys want to fill in some space here? I don't have the cooties. You guys might, and it might be better if we space out a little bit, fill in some spaces. I don't know what that is, yoga. We, like, either move forward or don't. But like the weird seductive pull your leg forward isn't very cool. No points with me for that one. Um, okay. Cool dupata. All right. Um, I was just driving up here with my whole family in the car, safely in the carpool lane, driving with the flow of traffic, maybe slightly faster than the speed limit, but certainly with the regular flow of traffic. And some crazy person next to me decided to suddenly cross the double yellows and go deep into my lane. You follow? So I'm in the carpool lane, minding my own business, driving like a citizen, and this hooligan in a car to the right of me jumped over halfway into my lane. Not like a little bit over the double yellows, but they made a deep, they made a deep cut into my lane. And they did so when I was kind of just in their blind spot. They might have been trying to illegally switch in the lane, but it was too late for me to break because I was just on them. And it was too late for me to speed up. And there was no emergency lane. You know how sometimes the road's like that? There's no emergency lane, it's just the divider. Have you ever noticed how if you drive on the freeway and you look at the center divider, there's black marks on it? You know what that is? That's car accidents. Each one of those black marks represents a car accident. Those things don't get there on their own. That's not pollution or smog. All those skids you see along that center divider are where somebody swiped it. The road's a dangerous place. I think it's 1.25 million people a year die on the road. It's not, the numbers are big, huge numbers. Um, <clears throat> you know, 5 million people a year die of smoking. So 1.25 million is not a small number. It's a lot of people dying. Anyway, my, my wife, of course, screamed as if that's going to help me. Uh, she's sitting next to me. She turns and screams in my ear as if that's going to, like, improve our chances of survival. <laughs> the scream alone would, like, like, you know. And so anyway, I, 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 you know, I nudged it. I got over, came up real close to that center divider to give a little bit of room because you know it's not like the center divider is right there on the edge so you got a few inches at least even if they've taken out the emergency lane so i nudged over you know right up close and personal with that center divider wall and then they got up and close and personal with me and i just managed to squeak out and i actually hit the gas because it was just it was in that spot right there where there was nothing else for me to do um, my wife was angry at me. So there was a song playing on the radio that I liked, so I, I didn't bother engaging with the missus until the song was over. And then when the song was over, I said, you know, like, what are you so bent about? What's the problem here? I didn't do anything wrong. I was driving safely. Um, she said, well, I, we almost died. I don't care if you're driving safely or not. That was her response. She said it a couple times. She thought it was a legitimate argument. I, I, I beg to differ. I don't care if you were driving safely or not. Our whole family almost died. So she was angry at me. 
But I said, it absolutely does matter. If I had been meandering through traffic or doing something illegal and we almost died, then I think you have grounds to be angry at me, to be angry at me because of the mistake of another person that I have no ability whatsoever to control, that I could not possibly have anticipated or accounted for. That's not fair. I don't know what she grunt. I don't want to say grunted. My wife doesn't grunt, but she mumbled something. And that was because of the end of the conversation. And I thought, oh, this is a great thing to give class about. This was, you know, like eight minutes before I walked in the door. I was like, this is a great thing to give class about. Um, okay, so that was our exchange. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, that was our exchange. So my angry wife berating me for something that I had no control over. Married Life 101, <laughs> at least from the guy's perspective. I'm sure my wife has a Married Life 101 from her perspective, which casts me as the villain. Um, Okay, so that happened. I also argued with her that, you know, if they reached into my lane and touched us, they weren't really trying to go into the lane. They were just spaced out and floating. So they would have touched us, and then they would have jumped back. And I would have been able to control the car, and we wouldn't have gone careening into a full-blown accident. It would have just been a little scrapage, high-speed scrapage. We would have made it through. I was... I, I debated with her on whether it would have led to the demise of our whole family and a catastrophic accident. I'm not 100% on that, but we were in an argument, so I, I thought I had a reasonable case, so I ran with it. Um, but my, my critique of my wife's accusation, my critique of her argument, my critique of her attack, is, is a little more systemic than just, you know, whether I, we would have crashed or not. Um, and there's a verse I thought of from the Gita. The verse is, uh, Karma nas hyapi bodhavyam, bodhavyam cha vi karmanaha, akarma nas cha bodhavyam, gahana karma no gati. So the almost accident coupled with the ensuing mini debate that my wife and I had reminded me of this verse that was a verse that my guru quoted in a class he gave in 1991 1990 1991 that convinced me to join the Hare Krishna movement as a, as my life's work I was 17 when I heard the class. I'm 48 now. The class was 31 years ago. It was 1990. Um, 30 years ago, I guess. And so, uh, beginning of the year. So I was 17. I turned 18. I'm 47 last week. I turned 48 this week. Um, I can remember the class. It was in Granada Hills up in the, in the valley, in the San Fernando Valley. Um, it was a really nice devotee family that lived up there. And uh, he gave the class. I can remember the sound of his voice. It's the, the, the verse is, Karmanas cha bodhavyam bodhavyam cha vi karmanaha. The way my Guru Maharaj speaks, he chose to elongate the word vikaramanaha, and he said vikaramanaha. I can remember the sound of his voice. He also elongated gahana into gahana, which means difficult, profound. Gahana karmanogati, the path of karma is difficult to, to understand. Difficult to fathom. Karmana, karmanaha, which becomes karmanas. Hyapi, hyapi, uh, even only, 
the path of karma, you should understand. Bodhavyam means it should be understand, understood. Bodhavyam, like Buddha, should be understood, like Buddhi. Karma nascha bodhavyam. Bodhavyam cha vi karma naha. A karma nascha bodhavyam. Gahana karma no gatihi. That's my best attempt to uh, replicate my Guru Maja's uh, melodious voice. The way, he, the deep way. And that's not so melodious. He's also incredibly melodious, but it was the deep way in which he recited the verse. I don't really remember much of the class, to be honest. I was young and foolish, and my powers of um, comprehension weren't so well weren't so well developed. I remember the sound of his voice chanting the verse. And I remember the impact it had on me. It made me decide to join the Hare Krishna movement. But in terms of what he said during the class, I don't really remember. Karma nas cha bodhavyam. You should understand karma. Bodhavyam cha vikarma naha. You should understand vikarma. A karma nas cha bodhavyam. It, it, the way it's written is it, it, it should be, it is to be understood. But the way it, it, it actually, what it conveys in English is you should understand this. Karma is to be understood. The karma is to be understood. A karma is to be understood. The path of karma is profound, is difficult to fathom. That's the verse. That's a literal translation of the verse. Bodhavya means it is to be understood. Karma nas cha bodhavyam. Karma is to be understood. Bodhavyam to be understood. Cha vi karma naha. Vi karma is to be understood. They just switch these order the words. Karma is to be understood. To be understood is vi karma. A karma is to be understood. The path of karma is difficult to understand. That's the verse. So. When you put V in front of a word in Sanskrit, it modifies it, it intensifies it. So if you put V in front of mukti, mukti means liberation. V mukti means the best liberation. Karma means action. V karma means the worst action. V is an intensifier. It's not always a good intensifier. It's neutral. And depending on the word that it's in front of as an prefix, it then modifies the word and intensifies it, either making it the worst version of that or the best version of that. Does that make sense? So karma means action. You should understand what is action. You should understand what is sinful or forbidden action. And you should understand what is a karma. When you put an A in front of a word in English as well as in Sanskrit, it means the opposite. So just like if you put an A in front of theist, it means atheist means you don't believe in God. Or you have a Gnostic and you put A in front of Gnostic, you have an agnostic, and that is someone who doesn't know. So an A in front of a word means the opposite. Same thing in Sanskrit. So you should understand action, forbidden action, and inaction. The path of action is difficult to fathom. Here's Prabhupada's excellent translation of the verse. The intricacies of action are very hard to understand, therefore one should know properly what action is, what forbidden action is, and what inaction is. That's the verse. My guru spoke about vikarma, what you should not do. And for me, without him mentioning the specifics, just him talking around the idea that there are things that you should not do, things you know you should not be doing, things you need to be avoiding, just him speaking in a generic way about forbidden action triggered me. 
it made me think of one very specific thing I was doing wrong in my life. At this point in my life, at 17, I was chanting for two hours a day, following all four regular principles, going to the temple seven days a week, going to the morning program, Mangalarti, at least three or four days a week, eating only prasadam, offering all my food. So I was doing pretty well, but I had one thing I was still doing that I shouldn't be doing. What are you snickering about? I, 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 I guess. What is it? Think it's no, I was following all four regular principles. Unless you have a profoundly ignorant idea of what the four regular principles consist of, then you wouldn't, or, or unless you were completely ignoring what I said, just snickering like randomly and spastically at various intervals without any reason behind it, you would know I wasn't smoking ganja because I was following all four regular principles strictly. You got it? And when I say strict, I mean strict. Full four regs, just like a brahmachari. Just like a good brahmachari. You know what the four other principles are? No meat, fish, or eggs is one. So, vegan. I was a vegan. Vegan slash vegetarian. Number two, no illicit sex. That includes masturbation or whatever else people come up with in order to illegitimately or illicitly orgasm. None of that. No gambling. Didn't even play the lottery. And no drugs. I didn't even drink coffee at that point. I wasn't even eating chocolate. So I was following the four other principles. I was chanting 16 rounds. I was going to the temple seven days a week without fail. And I was going to Mangalarti like three, four, five days a week, depending on the week, eating only prasad. eating only offer food. But when he said the karma, and he started speaking in a generic way about giving up the karma, forbidden action, it triggered me, and I thought immediately of something I was doing that I shouldn't be doing. You know what it was? Anybody who knows me should know what it was. Huh? I just said I wasn't even eating chocolate. I just said that. You guys somehow or other, you guys are like hanging out together. Yeah, it's like an idiot's club over here. Yeah. I was selling ganja. Yeah. I was like a medium level ganja dealer. Back in the days when that was actually criminal. Nowadays, that's the equivalent of operating a 7-Eleven or something like that. It's just on every street corner there's a dispensary. But it used to be that selling ganja was a, like a pretty serious criminal offense. And I was really attached to doing it because I made really good money for doing very, very little work and it was fun and dangerous and exciting and incredibly lucrative. And I knew it was wrong, but I just was like having a hard time giving it up. And I heard that class, and it made me think, OK, I got to give this up. It wasn't quite that simple. I heard the class, decided I have to give it up. I'd been traveling with my guru for three days. I turned my pager off. This was before the days of cell phones. I went home, I turned my pager back on, and I had dozens of messages, and I went out and made $5,000 profit in one night, in a couple of hours, because I disappeared, and my whole crew of people that were part of my downline were then put into like a famine situation, and they were deprived of ganja for almost a week, and they were losing their mind, and so I created this artificial um, famine. I created this artificial like uh, um, reversal of the supply and demand matrix, and all of a sudden everybody wanted to buy enough to last them, you know, a week or two, and I made a bunch of money just like that. I got sucked back into it again, and then 
got into a horrific motorcycle accident and almost died. And as I was flying through the air, I remembered that I should have given up selling ganja. And then and I hit the pavement and I was going to the hospital. Then I was like, okay, all right, I'll give up. I, like, I'll, I'll join the temple. Like, I'll, I learned my lesson, Krishna. I got it. So I wasn't smart enough to learn by the, by the instruction of my guru. I heard the instruction, learned my lesson, didn't have the courage and fortitude to follow through, and then was punished severely immediately for my lack of obedience. And then I pivoted and switched gears and changed my life. Best decision I ever made. Absolutely the best decision. I, my gurus are the best decision I ever made, but not really because the idea of giving my life to Krishna, which in many ways was the fruit of my connection with Guru, uh, that, that's going to keep me in the right direction forever. Marrying my wife was the best decision I ever made, but not compared to that because that orienting my life towards Krishna, making this my life's work and making chanting and following and serving my life's mission, that's everything. That trumps family. It trumps everything. Okay. Ultimately, that and following Guru is one and the same for me because I got the inspiration from the same, you know, from the devotee, as everybody does. So, yeah. Karma nascha bodhavyam, karma nascha pi bodhavyam, bodhavyam chavi karma naha. A karma nascha bodhavyam gahana, karma no gatihi. I didn't remember the verse, but just I remembered the word vi karma what you shouldn't do. My Guru Maharaj looked around the room and goes, you know what you shouldn't do. And it, it triggered me. And I was like, okay, I gotta change my life. That was a tangent. The verse is relevant to today's discussion. What is karma? Karma means action in Sanskrit. In English, it means reaction. That's usually called karma pal in Sanskrit, the fruit of karma. Karma pal, the fruit of karma, is reaction. Karma also sometimes means action and reaction. In English, when we say karma, we mean reactions. Karma is what you're supposed to do and when you're doing what you're supposed to do, then whatever happens to you is not your fault. If you are driving properly on the road and you get into an accident that you could not have avoided and it was not a result of your negligence, then legally you're not responsible. If you were driving properly on the road, and there's an accident, somebody jumps in front of your car, or a car hits you and then the people in that car die, if they don't show any negligence, if you're not intoxicated, if you are doing everything properly according to the law, and a bunch of people die getting into an accident with you, is it your fault? Is it? It's not. If you're a soldier and you're fighting in a war and you kill people while following the rules of engagement, that's not murder. You are um, indemnified. You have immunity 
because you were, or a police officer, firing his weapon in the line of duty in a justified shooting. He's not guilty of murder. He has immunity. To remove the um, uh, conditional immunity of a police officer, you have to prove that they were acting outside the scope of what the law allowed them to do. That's on the part, the prosecution has to prove that. If the police officer was, do, was acting within the line of duty, according to the instructions of superiors, even if he committed a heinous crime uh, that for anybody else, he's not guilty. He has qualified, qualified, excuse me, conditional, quali it's called qualified immunity. Diplomats sometimes have full immunity. There's nothing you can do. They commit murder in this country. You can't, person, you can't prosecute them. Usually, if somebody commits murder and they're a diplomat, then the country that they have the immunity from will give up their immunity and allow you to prosecute them. But if they don't, you have to let the person go home. You can make them a persona non grata, which means they're never allowed in your country again. But you cannot, per you cannot prosecute them if they have full immunity, which serious diplomats do. Their car is part of their nation. So if they, if they get in their car and drive to the airport, at no point do they step on U.S. soil. They're always given full immunity. Um, if you're acting appropriately, things will happen to you in life, and those things aren't your fault. And when I say they're not your fault, when I say they're not your fault, when I say they're not your fault, I don't mean that they're not ultimately your fault. I mean they're not your fault in this lifetime. If you're driving your car legally and properly and someone smashes into you, and a bunch of your kids die. It's tragic and you should be sad, but you shouldn't blame yourself. That was your karma and your kid's karma from another lifetime or from earlier in this lifetime. What happens to you while you're doing your duty properly should be accepted as your karma and you should tolerate it. You know, sometimes you go back and you think, what could I have done differently? And you torture yourself with that kind of stuff. That's only valuable if you've actually done something wrong. But if you haven't done something wrong, then you should accept what happened to you as your karma and be peaceful. It may be a slightly theoretical notion at the outset, at the beginning, but you should cultivate that understanding. Otherwise, you'll go insane because you think you're, a, you're a, in full control of this world and every single thing that happens is up to you to determine and, and fix and, and figure out. And it'll just drive you insane because this world is actually out of your control. V karma is what you shouldn't be doing. Like if you, if you one time, Prabhupada's disciple, we have this charanamrit, this like when we bathe the deities ritually in our temple, we then drink the water every morning as an act of devotion like a Eucharist. And so that water, which is sweetened slightly, is drunk by the devotees as an act of faith kind of like touching water when you go into a Catholic church, or more properly, like accepting the Eucharist as a daily devotion. So devotees in the Hare Krishna movement drink a couple of droplets of that water as an act of faith after the morning ritual worship has concluded. One time, one of the devotees who was in charge of preparing that, so the water comes off the altar and it's mixed with a sweetener and 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 you know, it's made it's put into a nice receptacle and then it's administered uh, to to the congregation by the priests. 
one time um, a devotee accidentally put salt in it and gave it to Prabhupada and Prabhupada drank it and he said it has salt in it it's not sugar and the boy said oh Krishna's arrangement and Prabhupada said oh you shouldn't confuse your stupidity with Krishna's arrangement One time Prabhupada said, you know, the devotees were driving un at an unsafe speed, and Prabhupada said, you know, they said, oh, Krishna will protect us. Prabhupada said, Krishna gets out of the car at 75 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, put mute all. It's very simple. Thank you. And so, If I climb up to the top of a building and jump off, technically, when I hit the ground and go splat, I'm getting instant karma for the act of jumping off the building. If you do something foolish, then you need not look to another lifetime or some, you know, previous thing that you're unaware of. You just look at what you did right before. If I'd been driving erratically and meandering through traffic and we almost got in an accident, that would be my fault. I would be responsible. We wouldn't have to look for some unknown cause. What I just did would explain it perfectly and that would be my instant karma or very, very short-term, almost immediate ensuing karma. You follow? Sometimes you're playing by the rules, you're doing everything right, and something just comes out of left field and whammies you, like a car, ripping into you while you're driving and following all the rules of the road. If you've understood what your duty is in life, and you're properly doing your duty, then you can accept that and not blame yourself and not beat yourself up for it because you did what you were supposed to do. And that's out of your control. You can accept it as your karma and be peaceful with it. If you don't take this mindset, you'll go insane. Trying to control an uncontrollable world trying to account for every variable that you can't possibly account for and trying to figure out how you're responsible for stuff that goes back so far you couldn't possibly remember. If you don't take blame for it, that you ultimately deserved it and it was your karma, then you got to blame God. Could God have created a world where you only got what you deserved? The answer is yes. Would an all-good God have created a world where you only get what you deserve? The answer is yes. Therefore, if an all-good God, an all-powerful God, an all-good God would want to create a world where you only get what you deserve, an all-powerful God could create such a world, and therefore, if God did not create such a world, and create a world where you were alone, and you got a bunch of stuff you didn't deserve, then God's either not all good or all powerful. And pretty quickly you become an atheist. If you want to believe in an all good, all powerful God, then you have to conceive that whatever happens to you in this lifetime, you deserve. Either because of your immediate idiocy or because of something you did in the past that you can't remember. If you learn what karma is and what v karma is, you avoid v karma and you perform your karma, things will happen to you. Those things are beyond your control. Those are the results and those you can let go of. And so this idea, this understanding, this philosophical mindset is actually behind the idea of doing your duty but not being attached to the results. It's the bedrock or the foundation of the idea of doing your duty but not being attached to the results. This is the philosophical underpinnings of the virtue that we propound that you should do your duty but not be attached to the result. It comes from this understanding. Figure out what my karma is. Figure out what V karma is. Avoid the V karma. 
perform the karma, and be peaceful. And then things will happen, but those things are beyond my control. The one data point I could control for, the one variable I could control, am I doing my duty? I did control for that, and that's outside of, now it's outside of my sphere of influence. I'm pretty sure I made sense. Did you guys all follow that? Okay. Did you follow that? Okay. All right. A karma. A karma. Inaction. Inaction means you, you don't do something forbidden, but you should have done something and you didn't, therefore it was a criminal negligence. You didn't do anything, but you were supposed to do something. And so to stay in place, you had to tread water. But you didn't, so you sink. That's inaction. Does that make sense? You should, you should have done something, but you didn't. You should have fed your children, but you didn't. So you can say, I didn't do anything. Yes, but your lack of action is criminal negligence. Therefore, you get some reaction. The next verse says you have to learn to see karma within a karma. That when you don't do your duty, you're actually doing something. You're not going to control it. It's just going to go away on its own. See that? Let's open that door for me, Hari Bhakta. Thank you. The next verse says you should learn to see karma within a karma and a karma within karma. This indicates that there's two understandings of the word a karma, inaction. One understanding is you should have acted, but you didn't and therefore you're going to get a result from not doing your duty. That's seeing karma within a karma. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. It's, from a, it's a lyric from a song called Free Will by a, a prog band named Rush. I was a fan of. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So sometimes not acting can get you some karma. Sometimes acting gets you no karma. Sometimes surgically doing your duty, tactfully doing your duty in this world, leaves you like Teflon. And things just like a lotus in the world but not of it, in the water but not wet in the mud but not muddy. It's a different meaning of a karma. The next verse clarifies you need both readings. You have to learn to see that sometimes you do your duty but because you did it right with the right mindset as a service then you get no reaction. You can sleep peacefully at night irrespective of the result. Alternatively, you might not do anything. Frozen or paralyzed for whatever reason. But you'll get your karma. 
because you should have jumped and you didn't. So the little mini argument my faithless wife and I had reminded me of these points. For her, she was just concerned about the result, our family not dying. She's like, what difference does it make? I'm like, it makes all the difference in the world. If I was doing my duty and we got wiped out, then it wasn't my fault. It would suck. I'd be dead, so I would have moved on. But, but I would have been doing my duty. If alternatively I was being negligent, then I'd be tortured forever. It does actually make a difference. Same result. If you were properly situated doing your duty, you can survive that and thrive and be okay and be peaceful. Still be sad. It's not like you become an automaton or something like that, but not that tortured guilt, shame eats away at you, makes you slit your wrists. We got to know what our duty is. We got to make sure that we're not afraid to jump. Heroes get scared too. They just move. And then we also got to understand what we shouldn't be doing. And my guru spoke on this 30 years ago, maybe 30 years and six months ago. And it, it affected me. Changed my life. I don't remember the class. I just remember the sound of his voice, Vikara Manaha. And his like chastising, you know what you shouldn't be doing. And I just did the arithmetic. And and it became clear what I needed to do. And I didn't jump. And so Krishna was kind. He made me jump. They say if, if Muhammad, Muhammad went to a mountain to get some of his inspiration, if Muhammad doesn't go to the mountain, then the mountain comes to Muhammad. That's the famous... Arabic saying. So Krishna was kind to me. I was like a little mini Muhammad. Krishna was kind. He, I didn't listen to the lesson, and so he arranged to immediately force me to listen to the lesson. He upped the ante. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Um, Yell at me, so I don't have to repeat it. So my question is that there is karma, karma, and akarma. And I was wondering, how does the material modes of nature affect these things? Did you hear that, Matt? Karma, v karma, and akarma. Action, forbidden action, and inaction, which could either be you're moving, but you're Teflon. Or you're not moving, but you're actually doing something wrong. Whoever's got their kid in the background and continuously keeps unmuting themselves, mute yourself. I keep muting you, and you unmute yourself. And then make drama. Just sit mute all one more time. They'll figure it out. They keep turning it off, yeah. That's okay. Mute them all again. When it's blue, I mean, it's on. There we go. Um, karma, v karma, a karma. And so yoga was asking, how do those things match up with the modes? I don't know. I don't think you have to match them up with the modes. Um, I, I, I've... There's not a lack of understanding on my part. I'm answering your question. I don't think you need to match them up with the modes. I think that this understanding is complete in and of itself and does not require to be matched up with the modes. In fact, Krishna, who speaks extensively about the modes 
throughout the Gita, somehow or other, chooses not to bring them up as a threefold way of understanding this phenomenon. Let's say you were an executioner. That's kind of a standard, low-class job. Historically speaking, executioners were outcasts in most societies. Let's say you were born into a family of executioners. You were in the guild system in ancient Europe, medieval Europe. You're an executioner. Your dad was a village executioner. You were the executioner. Your duty was to kill criminals. You weren't the judge. You weren't the jury. You were the executioner. Decisions on who to kill were above your pay grade. You sharpen your sword, disembowel people for the least amount of time possible, pray for everybody you kill, do your duty, feel bad when you miscut their neck and they're like riding around, bleeding and like freaking out because you didn't get a nice clean cut. That was a big deal in samurai culture. After you disemboweled yourself in seppuku, then your friend would hack your head off after you'd suffered enough and regained your honor through suffering, then your friend would cut your head off with one clean stroke. If he messed up and got the wrong angle, then it brought great shame to his family and him as a warrior. And it also caused you a ton more suffering. Now you're like disemboweled and your neck's half cut off and he's got to reset and you're like, it would, like, it would really suck. You know, I took a big clean hack at your neck and didn't get through. But if you're an executioner, which is about the most tamasic mode of ignorance position you could have, I think you could be a Vaishnava. I think you'd be a devotee. There's this idea that you have to move from ignorance to passion to goodness, to transcendence. I don't necessarily believe that. I believe that transcendence is available to everybody, and then their actions might look like they're in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance. If someone's doing their duty properly, they're transcendent. I think Krishna purposefully avoids using the lens of the gunas for analyzing this, because this is actually another way of looking at the world. Therefore, your attempt to bring it within the three gunas is to actually miss the point that Krishna was trying to make. Do you understand my answer? I didn't misunderstand your question. I didn't need you to speak more. You didn't understand my answer. <laughs> that was the problem. Does that help? That's a good question. Appreciate the question. More questions or comments? I mean, I got more to say. I kind of paused and yoga just jumped in. But it's okay. We can, I, I think what I spoke was, I think I bookended it enough. We can move into the next phase. I'm cool with that. Yell at me, Manu. Yeah, um, and he yelled. He legitimately yelled. It's like the best, best vocalization I've had here in months. And they still didn't hear him. So I'm probably going to have to repeat what you say. So just mutter at me and I'll repeat it. Can you talk a little about Yeah, our consciousness is ultimately a factor. It's true, but this in some ways doesn't actually require that. This, is, this precedes that. So although it's true, you could fight in the battle because of your material nature, or you could fight in the battle because Krishna instructed it, and you would get two different results. And Krishna says as much in the Gita. Doesn't say as much. He says exactly that in the Gita. That ultimately comes down to, are you doing this for God or for yourself? In a lot of ways, not in a lot of ways, this precedes that. 
Before you start thinking about your consciousness, figure out what you're supposed to do. I had to give up selling ganja. I could give up selling ganja to become famous as like a Hare Krishna devotee or whatever, some I don't know, whatever, low-level, mid-level ganja dealer who gave it up for a, because of a spiritual awakening. And maybe that would like catapult me into an Oprah showing, you know, in five or ten years if I wrote the right book. Um, so we could talk about my consciousness. Like I used to go out and sell books. And so the, the problem there was sometimes I would sell books. I would sell religious literature to strangers giving all the money to my church. But in my mind I'd be thinking, I want to sell more books than my fellow monk so I'll get the high score so people will see that I'm the best religious literature seller. You follow? And so your consciousness can bring you down, no doubt. And Krishna does address that in the Gita. He brings up, you got to do the right thing for the right reason. But before you got to do the right thing for the right reason, what do you have to do? The right thing. In a lot of ways, this lesson precedes that deeper understanding. It's about understanding what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. I've got more. Does that make sense? Yeah, not part of what doesn't make sense? No, so far. Oh, so far it makes sense. Okay. All right. Now, within the word a karma, I offer two meanings of a karma. A primary meaning, which is that you do your duty, excuse me, you don't do something that you should be doing. The secondary meaning is you're doing something, but because you're doing it in the right way, you're actually doing nothing and you're transcendent. That second meaning of the term a karma is what you're talking about. If you do something in the right mindset, then you don't get karma. If you do the right thing with the wrong mindset, you're still bound. It's a more subtle bondage but it's bondage nonetheless. You follow? Your attachment to being the doer. Don't consider yourself to be the doer. Your idea that I'm the doer. Kart aham iti manyate. You think I'm the doer. That binds you to this world. Even you're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. It's not bhakti. The result of dharma, there's something called the chat. Uh, what's it called? It's called uh, mm, Dharma Arta Kama Moksha. It's called the yeah. I can't believe I'm like killing myself here. Pram Pumartam Prushartas. The four goals of man, the four means of man. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. It's a classic uh, fourfold way of analyzing the world that you find in Manu, in the Manu Sanghita, and other early legal texts. You do your Dharma, you do your religion, your karma, you do the right thing. And then you get Artha, Artha means wealth. Then from that wealth, you get Kama, you get sensual desires fulfilled. You get a nice home, you get a nice wife, a nice husband, a nice family. And then you get moksha. You get frustrated with that because it doesn't satisfy, and you go for liberation. Dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Do the right thing, get a good material result, enjoy the good result, and eventually get over it and go for liberation. Dharma, artha, kama, moksha. We had a fifth one. Panch purusharta. The fifth goal of life, which is love of God. You follow? Bhakti done for the wrong reasons is dharma. Bhakti done for the wrong reason isn't bhakti. You end up just enjoying this world. You follow? 
if you're out distributing books for the wrong reasons, that's going to catch up with you. I remember I used to see devotees sometimes. They'd be out there selling books, but they'd be like talking only to the really sexy looking girls walking by. And they'd like spend way too long talking to them. And they'd like holding their hand, like exchanging phone numbers, and like just preaching up a storm to them for like hours and hours on end. And like, oh, like always hugging them way too much and being like a little too sexy with them. And I was like, dude, you guys are like a joke, you know? They're like a bunch of chumps, you know? And none of those guys lasted. They were all gone. They were, they were creamsicles wearing saffron on the outside, but they're all white on the inside. They're dressed like brahmacharis, but they're actually, our married priests were white, our unmarried priests were saffron. So they were a creamsicle. They were orange on the outside, but their heart was white. You follow? And they didn't last. And they didn't, not even like they got married to some qualified girl. They fell down like a knucklehead. Made a fool out of themselves. You gotta do the right thing for the right reason. If you don't do bhakti for the right reason, it's not bhakti. So in many ways, this verse precedes that verse. That idea in that it's about what's your duty and what's your forbidden duty. That's the beginning. That's what you should be thinking about. Eventually, while you're doing your duty, you know concretely what your duty is. Now you've got to work on, on a more subtle level. And you've got to do the right thing for the right reason. And as you deepen, that right reason deepens with you. If you want to find the whole package within the verse, that meaning of akarma as bhakti would be a small homage or foreshadowing of that lesson that eventually gets explicated fully in the Gita. Does that answer now satisfy? Yeah. Okay. It's a good question too. Okay. Okay. Laptop burning. Got a burning laptop. We're down to two minutes. Anybody else want to jump in? So just to wrap it up, I'm driving on the road. We almost get hit by a meandering person going over the double yellows. My wife freaks out on me, doesn't care if it was my fault or not. It was relevant to me. We argued. I thought of this verse, this verse that changed my life. I don't even remember how it was taught, but I remember the word vikarma and how it was a trigger for me to reflect deeper on what I needed to do, what I needed to change in my life. I didn't go to the mountain, so the mountain came to me a couple of times. I eventually did learn my lesson. There's a lot of value in this verse. You don't need the three modes. You don't even need an understanding of bhakti. This precedes all that. Do your duty. Don't do the wrong thing. Don't do forbidden things. Things are going to degrade you. And don't just sit around waiting for everything to happen. Have the courage to jump up and do your part. Don't be attached to the results. If you follow this, things will happen in life, but they won't bury you. You'll be able to sleep peacefully at night. As you grow up and get deeper, you'll then be able to do the right thing for the right reason. And even that's subtly woven into the verse in the word akarma. And there you go. If you're joining us on Instagram, thank you very much. If you're on Zoom and Facebook, you can hang out for another second.